Hi, hello. <laughs> yeah, hype, hype, hype. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we have a very, very exciting panel with Fred Seibert today. Um, very excited to talk about so many things with him. I hope everyone's enjoyed their day. Um, you know, when when putting together a bio for you, there's such a, an amazing history that you've had in your career. I've had no career. You've had no career. <laughs> You, there's there is no career. Uh, however, it's it's pretty impressive and amazing to sort of go through Fred's accomplishments throughout his career. And so I, I took a little bit of a pass at at writing one. Um, so from jazz cat to TV cartoon producer, Fred Seibert has lived many lives. From forming a blues and jazz label in the '70s and getting nominated for a Grammy to a cable pioneer founding and launching MTV, VH1, and Nick at Night, also leading the team that developed I Want My MTV, iconic. Um, to a branding and agency executive whose credits uh, include naming and writing the original branding and positioning for Comedy Central and overseeing the relaunch of Nickelodeon. I know it's so fun to hear this all repeated <laughs> in front of your face. Um, but I want everyone to hear this. Um, to an internet network executive creating next new networks and the concept of multi-channel networks. To forming Frederator Networks and Channel Frederator Network, now the world's largest animation network. To a television cartoon producer where he was president of Hanna-Barbera Cartoons, creating 48 original shorts, an Academy Award nomination, two Emmy nominations, and seven original half-hour cartoon series, including, and this is just a, a small list of his credits, The Fairly Odd Parents, My Life as a Teenage Robot, yes, woo, uh, Adventure Time, The Powerpuff Girls, Johnny Bravo, and Dexter's Laboratory. Since then, Fred has been awarded several Annie Awards and Emmy Awards for his productions, and most recently, Fred announced this new, very exciting life as an independent cartoon producer creating Fred Films, with projects including Castlevania and Bee and Puppycat, Lazy in Space on Netflix, Costume Quest on Amazon Prime, and Adventure Time on HBO. Fred, welcome. I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> I'm tired. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I, I think my first question is, when do you sleep? <laughs> How do you find time in the, in the amazing list of things that you've done? You know, um, the good news for me is I don't know how to do a almost any of those things. <laughs> so uh, Casey, my colleague, Casey Gonzalez, does the work, and I get to talk here. I, I'm, I'm, but I, to some degree, I'm, I'm actually really serious. I am not a skilled um, practitioner. I don't, the last time I had a skill was when I was 26 years old and I was an audio editor and I thought I wanted to be the Beatles producer, mm -hmm. but they had broken up. And um, I learned this great lesson from a, a famous engineer about how to be a producer, mm -hmm. which is, he told me, make sure you have the right person in the room. Mm -hmm. And from then on, I stopped being interested in all of the details and just tried to find people that I, that I wanted to be a fan of mm -hmm. and I could ask them how I could help them. And so my job isn't what almost everybody here has, which is skills that they practice on a regular basis and they get better and better and better at those skills. I'm a fan for a living. Mm. I get to be a professional fan and hopefully steer people to people who can help them. Mm -hmm. So that means I get to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> A fan who sleeps. Yeah. Um, but, but I think what's been so true throughout your career is you've always had such a vision. I mean, almost everything that you've created or started has, has launched with this sort of new and inventive idea. How does the line between having that vision sort of grow from just being a fan? You know, how have you sort of gotten these ideas to help create? Th that's actually the simple part. Mm. I think if we were to go across the street uh, to the Smith restaurant, and ask every single person there, so what would you do if you ran a television network? Or what would you do if you made a movie? Or what would you do if you wanted, what record would you make if you had a chance to make a record? Every one of us as consumers of this stuff that we are involved in, we know what we would do. Mm. The question is, is do you have a chance to do it? 
So um, I tell this story often, but so at every major career juncture, I, I turned it down. Mm. I had no interest in doing something different. I was interested in what I was doing at the time. And I, I really wanted to be a record producer because I came from the era where popular music was the driver of the culture. Mm -hmm. You know, if Paul McCartney uh, admitted that he took LSD, it was front page news across <laughs> the world. Now, if a rock star, unless they murder somebody, they don't make the paper. You know, they're not interesting. But in my era, they were interesting, and I wanted to be, I was a fan. So I got a job offer. I was in radio. I was doing, I had a day job in radio. And a guy calls me up and said, hey, I heard you might want to work for me in cable TV. And this was in the days when cable TV was like VR is now. It was like some, what, what is this thing? And I said, no, 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 I, I watch TV, I don't, I don't make it. Mm -hmm. And whatever, whatever, he convinced me to come and work. I had made a couple commercials, and very small commercials. And I was working for um, the first 24-hour cable movie channel called The Movie Channel. And every time I wanted to do something, he told me I was doing it wrong because HBO didn't do it. Mm. And I'd go, well, you know, we're not HBO, we're us, and we should do it what we want to, no, no, do what they do, or, you know. So um, a month into the job, he announces that we're gonna start a music channel, and I go in and I convince him to hire me. Mm. And so he says yes, and now I have two jobs for no money, because <laughs> I had my old job and my new job. And I, I leave his office, I walk right back in, and I said, so just, just one thing. If you don't like my work or the work my team does, that's great. Just tell us we, we won't do it. But you can never, ever, ever tell me I can't do something because someone else isn't doing it. He said, how come? I said, well, nobody else is doing a music channel. We're the only one. And he said, okay. And by the way, he never, ever bothered me again. And it that lesson which has served me really really well is i don't take a job working for somebody doing something that somebody else is already doing because i don't know how to do that job mm -hmm. so i go to somewhere new because i'm a consumer and i go boy i wish that this would happen mm -hmm. there's nobody else there and nobody will tell me i can't do it so it becomes a really if if in every single case, whatever it is that all of us do, we're doing because we imagine what could be. Mm -hmm. And if the thing I'm imagining hasn't happened yet, I get to make it up. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. <laughs> yeah, and it's like the ultimate storyteller, right? Because storytellers oftentimes have to pave new paths, and so many filmmakers here today are creating their own stories that you know, need to be told in new and unique ways, and it feels like you've done that from an executive and producerial standpoint. Well. I'm going to assume that at least some people here have made a YouTube video. Anyone? <laughs> yep. So, so they have done the same thing. They produced, directed, edited, cast, wrote, whatever. They did their own thing. Mm -hmm. and we were just talking about it in relationship to one of the big media companies. Like, these people are their own media companies, and every single person here... Um, I assume that everybody here has some kind of smartphone with a camera in it. We, mm -hmm. we all have the capability of making films. Mm -hmm. And by the way, with our phone now, feature films we can make with our phone. Maybe some people have already done that, mm -hmm. actually. So there's nobody to tell us what to do if we don't want to be told what to do. Right. I guess that's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Well, and did you find, you know, in, in all of the new endeavors that you, you went through, uh, did you feel, I, you I don't to, I'm off now script now. Now you have to make it up. Exactly. <laughs> now it doesn't even matter. Don't worry. It's all up here. I'm going to pave. I'm going to, no one's going to tell me anything with this brain. Um, did you feel like there was a lot of people throughout your career who would say you couldn't do something? Or, oh, please. Yeah. yeah. Especially at the corporations. You know, I... I have distinguished, so I've worked for basically 50 years, and 10 of them I've worked for other people. Mm. Um, I call those the J-O-Bs. 
right? And sure, um, especially at the beginning, you know, I, um, I grew up about 40 miles from here. My parents had a, my parents were pharmacists, both of them, and we had a little mom and pop drugstore. And I'm the oldest child, so they had no money when they started it, and instead of a babysitter, they would show me the stock room at five and <laughs> like how to put things on the shelf, you know? So I've been working my entire life, but in my early years, I was the boss's son, so effectively, I was the boss. Mm. And I'm the oldest child, so I was really the boss. <laughs> um, now I get to a corporation, I'm not the boss. Mm -hmm. But I had this great um, get out of jail card in my pocket because everyone there, everyone wanted to be the CEO. And everyone desperately wanted their jobs. And I didn't. I was shocked that I had a job. <laughs> I was shocked that somebody was paying me and I couldn't imagine being at the job more than a year. And so when they would threaten me, I just look at them and go, I, I guess you really need this job. I said, I can always go to a drugstore and you know, put toothpaste on the shelf. And at that point they had no answer. And it's not that I would always win the argument, I often didn't win the argument. But you know, once they don't have you, once you aren't desperate for what they have, mm -hmm. you win, mm -hmm. like always. Mm -hmm. And I think you can tell a lot in this business when someone's really thirsty or when someone is really, you know, desperate. Well, caring and being desperate are two different yes. things, right? Yes. Like, again, everybody here is a filmmaker. Everybody cares about what it is they're doing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that flop sweat that you see in somebody when they are desperate? That, yeah. You can't win with the flop sweat. No. <laughs> you, you really can't. You really can't. Well, and you have been in so many leadership positions as well. We've been talking a lot, some of the filmmakers this week, we've been talking a lot about this idea. Is even as a filmmaker, really in any capacity, you need to be, be the CEO of your own brand. You need to really be the CEO of your own company, whatever that is, as a producer, as a maker. What have you found to be a great way in building your teams and leading people? Like, what have been some of the tenants that you've found to be really helpful as you build teams, as you become the CEO of these new companies? Um, I, I know that maybe this is gonna be hard to believe. I, I basically am looking for people who will do the work if I'm not around. Mm. And who really like, I have said to people often, why don't you tell me what the job is? Like, I don't know how to write a job description. Um, I don't know really what, I don't really know a lot of stuff, you know? Like, Casey, did I tell you what I wanted in a development person? I, I don't remember exactly. I, I wrote my own job description. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, part of that is because um, like with K Casey, I happen to have worked together, but in a completely different capacity at one of the companies that I had. And I knew I wanted to work with Casey. Mm -hmm. I'm done at that point, yeah. <laughs> right? Like she can write her own job description. And uh, I guess the only thing I would probably do is say, well, not really that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and you know, it when you, Gee, I don't know. Yeah. You know, honestly, yeah. I, I don't mean to be difficult. No, I, I think it, it really resonates. I think sometimes the best team you can build is a team you trust. And I think that seems like something you've really dr well, back been to driven the guy to. Who told me to put the right person in the room, you know, so I really want to be a record producer. Mm -hmm. And I really want to produce the Beatles. But, you know, they weren't going to have me. And I had started my college radio station. Uh, we were in New York City. We played a lot of jazz. And at the time, this is 50 years ago, New York City was the center of jazz culture in the universe. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's moved to your hometown of <laughs> LA and to uh, London, not so much in New York. Anyway, so jazz musicians 
of world class showed up at my college radio station all the time and often with their instruments ready to play and I was the one that was willing, I so wanted to record that I was the one that was willing to set up the microphones and you know do the mixing and all that type of stuff. And it led me to really, really low paying or free jobs of producing these records. Mm -hmm. So this one day I go, so I'm, I'm assigned the records usually. Mm -hmm. They're black American musicians usually 30, 40 years old. They've forgotten more than I'll ever know. I'm a 25-year-old white kid from the suburbs. And I had just become a jazz fan like a couple of years before. <laughs> I didn't know anything. And my basic job, I wasn't a producer in any kind of real sense. I had to just make sure the musicians got there and they recorded enough music. That, that was essentially the job. And I had to you know, have a stopwatch and time each of the tracks. Mm -hmm. So I go to this one session at the most famous jazz recording studio in the world, right over the George Washington Bridge in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey. The engineer's more famous than most of the musicians, but they're well known. And they, they don't know me, and I don't know them. Mm -hmm. So I go, hello, I introduce myself, I'm from the record company, you know, whatever, whatever. They go in, they set up their instruments, the engineer sets up all his stuff. And uh, I do my job. I hit the button. I go, take one. Guy does nothing. <laughs> Sits there. So a little louder. Take one. Nothing. I'm like, Rudy, did I, did I do something wrong? Did I fart? You know, like, <laughs> what, what, what's going on? And he goes, you keep looking at me and my equipment. And I went, yeah, well, you know, I'm really interested. You know, you're the best in the world. And the, the, I mean, which he literally was. And he goes, don't look at me. Don't look at the equipment. Don't ask me questions. Mm. And I'm like, okay. He goes, if you don't like what I do, go somewhere else. I said, no, I love what you do. That's why I'm here. He goes, look, kid. He didn't say kid. He goes, look. I've worked with the most famous producers in history, and I'm like, yes, Mr. Van Gelder, I understand. He goes, <laughs> they understood they only had one thing to do, which mm -hmm. who is in the room. Mm -hmm. What that's done for me consistently over the years is say, who do I want to work with? Mm -hmm. Not what do you do, what do we do? Like most of the time, I think I said to you earlier, I've started to realize that uh, my partner and I, when we got into TV, we were DIY before there was DIY. I didn't go to film school. I didn't learn anything about, I learned making television by making 1,000 10 second animated pieces for MTV and Nickelodeon. Teaching my, I mean, that was my film school, is like making these little 10 second things, each of which had a beginning, middle, and end that I didn't understand when I made the first one. Mm -hmm. And finding the talented filmmakers around the world to make these things was my training. Mm -hmm. It's the only training I still have. <laughs> you know, and you know, I've been lucky. Most of the time I have decent judgment. Again, you know, I've been working with Casey for several years. I'm like, I'm in awe of what she does. Mm -hmm. And what and how she can work with the creative people that we are working. We're working with two from Australia right now. We're working with a school teacher up in Portland, Oregon. We like. I don't know how we do all this stuff, but it <laughs> seems to work. Yeah. And that's because these people are good at what they do, and I just happen to be the person that was able to say, "Hey, why don't we do something together?" Mm -hmm. It's amazing, and I'm curious. Going back to your many I'm lives now that I'm now that I'm describing the, it. <laughs> <laughs> did you going from life one in the world of jazz to life two in television, or, or was life two more on the branding side? Well, I took a job as an executive at this cable TV company mm -hmm. um, that stumbled into being MTV, mm -hmm. um, and. My partner and I, well, look, I, my boss and I had both come out of radio. 
And you know, in a city like New York City, I think at the time there were like, let's call it 80 radio stations. Mm -hmm. And they were all in competition for, you know, what is one of the biggest markets in the world. But they had to distinguish themselves one to the other. It wasn't like they were, you know, all 80 stations were doing the same thing. They were each doing different things. And they had to explain to their potential listeners what they were doing. Right. right. So the biggest top 40 station in New York City when I was growing up was called WABC in mm -hmm. Los Angeles. It was KHJ. Mm -hmm. And they had slogans, right? In ABC's case, it was really easy. We're the all Americans with more music. And the guys down the street who were doing similar music, they said, we're the good guys from New York. Right, they, they distinguish what they were telling each other about somebody. Television didn't do that. At that point in media history, the average American had two channels of television. Now all of a sudden we're in a business where our boss is saying, well, you know, there's gonna be a hundred channels of television. And I panicked right away. And I was like, well, what do we do? Well, you figure it out, you know, it was like one of those. So my partner and I and my teams started figuring out, okay, what is this MTV thing? What is a music channel? And we literally went through a year of conversation about who were we, who were, we write a hundred things down on a, what we would now call a whiteboard. <laughs> And then we reorganize those hundred things into seven little buckets. Mm -hmm. And then we said, okay, we'll tell people about these seven things that we are. And we'll come up, you know, in our case, we came up with a logo that was sort of different than what everyone else did. And our boss said, well, why is the logo different than what everyone else does? They said, well, that way they'll know we're there, mm -hmm. right? They, they will know who we are with our identity. Mm -hmm. And I would fight with the guy in the office next door. He was the liaison with the record companies. And he would come in and he'd go, you know, the record company really wants us to put REO Speedwagon on our poster. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't give a fuck about REO Speedwagon. <laughs> what do you mean? I said, they're gonna be here today, gone tomorrow, just like every one of these people. Mm. I don't care about any of them. I only care about one thing. He goes, what's that? I go, the M. Mm. My job is to make the M a star. And we just fight about it. Mm -hmm. And our boss, you know, would sit there and go, you know, they're both right, but I'm not gonna tell them that. They can like fight for their, <laughs> you know, for their places. And all of a sudden that becomes what is media branding, mm -hmm. which is why I could quit and start a media branding <laughs> agency because no one else in the world was doing it. Yeah. And you know, every one of us looks for opportunities. Um, I was really lucky because I didn't want a J-O-B. Mm -hmm. So I was able to quit and start my own place with my partner and we were doing things that no one else would do. And as soon as the next branding company came up, we quit, we closed, <laughs> we were done. Because now I couldn't charge more money than anyone else. Mm -hmm. I had to compete for the dollar and who likes to, com you know, we're all in competition and we all hate it and we want to try and figure out a way to do something that nobody else is doing so we get to win. Mm -hmm. Well, and also, when you did have your own agency, I'm sure that was better because then you could really be the visionary with clients. You didn't have to really be on that client side anymore. You could really be making the decisions. Yeah, until we couldn't, which is why we closed the agency. <laughs> and then you started something new. You did. You went somewhere new. And so from there, we, we get into children's television. That's when Hanna-Barbera comes in Curious well, actually, how that happened. Well, along the way, actually, so um, when we quit MTV, you know, my boss said, well, what if I double your salary? Will you stay? Mm. And of course, I was an arrogant young so-and-so, and I said, well, you know, if you're paying me half the money that I deserve for all these years, I'm an idiot. I ought to leave. I'll, I'll make twice as much money on my own, which, of course, the first year we made zero. <laughs> um, and he hired us back as consultants for half the money. <laughs> so who's the idiot now? And along the way, um, he calls up one day 
and said, hey, you know, they just made me the president of the company. I said, yeah. He goes, and, you know, I fired as many people at Nickelodeon as I could because um, at the time, we hadn't gotten to 100 channels yet. We, cable in New York, in the States, was 30 channels. That happened fast. You mean from 30 to 100? Or from, ze- from like, I guess Zero when you start. 30? Yeah. Well, I guess you could say that, but television started in 1948, and it was 1980. Okay. Okay, and then it took, even from 1980 to 1984, when there were 30 channels, mm-hmm. there was HBO. Right. You know, and it was like, it happened, it, in retrospect, it happened really quickly, mm-hmm. and at the time, you know, you were slugging it out for every block you could get. So anyway, he calls up and he said, um, Nickelodeon has lost, in today's money, it would have been $250 million in four years. They, listen, I won't get into the details of their business model. Um, and if we don't fix it, they're going to close it down. So I fired as many people as we can, go in there and fix it. I'm like, what? No, understand, I'd been in television for three years. Um, MTV was a magic carpet that was going to fly with or without me or, and, and my partner. I think we did a good job, but I think we could have done a bad job and still <laughs> succeeded, right? I mean, it was like ready to succeed. So now he says, go in, and I go, what, what are you talking about? He says, well, it, it just doesn't work. Nobody watches. We got a sneak peek of... They didn't have ratings at the time, but we got a sneak peek. And uh, people who watch Nickelodeon watch for less than six minutes at a time. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. And what do you expect us to do? Because I don't know. Just you know, it was this, it was sort of like the reverse of what I just said. He was just telling me to fix it. And I was like, Bob, you know, um, we don't like those people at Nickelodeon. And we don't really like kids' TV. You know, we were 30. I mean, you know, we were rock and rollers. <laughs> and I said, you know, truth be told, I'm not even sure if we like kids. <laughs> <laughs> and then Alan, my partner, Alan Goodman, reminded me that we had no money and that they were going to pay us <laughs> for the job. So we went in. And the greatest thing happened, which is we met this woman named Jerry Laybourne. So... Um, Jerry had been, I think, like the director of acquisitions or something, but now this guy Bob had come in and fired all these people, including the boss. So that night, without telling anybody, Jerry moved from her tiny little director of acquisitions office into the boss's office, and I'm now I'm meeting her in the boss's office. And... It didn't unfold quite this way, but it was basically clear to Alan and myself that they knew nothing about television. But was just as clear within that first conversation is what Jerry Laybourne really understood were kids. She had been an educator. She had a couple of kids of her own. And over... A very short period of time, because by the way, she was as skeptical as us as we were of her. To her, we were the evil MTV people who were bringing the world down, you know, a horrible, drug-filled, sexist path. (laughs) And they were the people who were doing good things for the youth of America. But in that skepticism, we started each appreciating what the other had. And so here was what was common between MTV and Nickelodeon, which we were both obsessively focused on who our viewers would be, who our audience was. And what was really clear about general television in those days is they didn't really care about the people. It's actually, we're kind of in this situation now again in television. Nobody gives a crap about the audience. Everybody is just thinking about, how can I make a show that'll be a hit? And, mm-hmm. and we didn't understand how to succeed without understanding who that audience was. And Jerry was so focused on who those kids were. And over the years that we worked together, which I think was about 
almost 10 years. She just found out more and more and more about kids and she taught us more and more and more about who those kids were, how they spoke, what language they used, what they were interested in, what they weren't interested in, why they paid attention, why they didn't pay attention, how they were with their parents, how they weren't with their parents and their teachers, like everything. And we just translated that into a language that we understood, not because we were television experts, but because we were television viewer experts. We were like, just like everybody here, we watched a lot of television, and we go, you know what it should be like? And we could tell them that. Yeah. Am I yeah. on too much? No, no, Sorry. no, it's great. I think the audience is, you're exactly right. I mean, it feels like so many programming decisions are not based around audience today. Yeah, so um, that's how I started getting involved in kids programming because Again, well, what happened, I mean, the, the quick story was that Nickelodeon, which when we started working with them in June of 1984, they were number 30 out of cable networks. And in January of 1985, they were number one. Wow. And here's the only thing that changed, is instead of them spending less than six minutes, they were now spending 30 minutes. And that was, that was the, the job for us, ultimately, there were creative executions of it. The job was math. Mm -hmm. And could we change the math? And we were able to change the math. And did that sort of begin your sort of interest in care around children's programming? Was that sort of the shift for you and maybe led you into Hanna-Barbera and other places? I love audiences. Mm -hmm. Whatever audience I'm working with, if I'm not in love with them, like, I can't do that. Yeah. You know, we just had the uh, First Nations panel, which was fa fabulous, fantastic. And, you know, I couldn't offer one thing to those, to the filmmakers or to the audience. Because I, I, don't, know, I don't know how to be in love with that audience. I'm not that audience, mm -hmm. like, on any level. But, you know, I had been a kid. Right, and so I could put myself back to being a six-year-old watching television in New York City when it was the wild, I mean, <laughs> kids' television when I was a kid was so crazy. Mm -hmm. And this was the meeting that either was gonna make or break us with Nickelodeon. I walked in, Alan and I walked in, and we, we said, look, Nobody here is having a good time. Mm -hmm. All these people look miserable at their jobs. They're like, they, the women wear these nice little scallop collars and these little um, string ties, and they're very quiet and they're very serious about what they do. And you're in the kids' business, like what's going on here? Mm -hmm. So when we're done, I can't guarantee you ratings, but the few men that work here, because it was mainly a women's staff, the few men that were work here will be shooting spitballs. And you know, that woman over there, and I pointed to, does anybody here know Ann Sweeney who used to mm -hmm. work at Disney? Yeah. Ann Sweeney will be standing on her desk, her dress will be over her head with one hand and she'll be holding a tequila in the other hand. <laughs> and she'll be dancing. And they looked both frightened and excited at the same time, and we were in. They were either going to fire us at that moment or we we're going to be in. And so the thing that led me into kids programming wasn't kids programming, it was kids. Mm -hmm. and, and really reclaiming that feeling of being a kid and turning on the television and wondering what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't actually go to Hanna-Barbera with the notion that I was in kids programming, though Clearly we were. I went and I like, cartoons are a lot of fun. Yeah. I could do that. I had driven past the Hanna-Barbera building for 20 years wondering what went on in there because <laughs> I'm a child at Hanna-Barbera. Like uh, mm -hmm. Huckleberry Hound and Yogi Bear were my heroes mm -hmm. in the Flintstones. Yeah. And I wondered what went on in that building. And the first time I walked in, I was like the president of the studio. <laughs> it was, the whole thing was ridiculous. It worked, you know? Yeah.
when you you have your hand in so many aspects of the business and the creative I know you're doing now a lot of producing really hands-on producing did that also crystallize for you did it sort of become clear that the content or the production side of it was was calling you or or sort of how did that path lead you I always like making I like to make things yeah. You know, it's simple. You know, during the pandemic, I bought a saw and I built all the bookshelves in my house because mm -hmm. I had run out of money and I couldn't hire anybody to do it. And when the Beatles came out, um, I put down my accordion, which I played, and I put down my flute, which I played, and I got a guitar and started a band. Mm -hmm. um, it's just all about making things. And, you know, ultimately... Um, I made things when I was a branding guy and a promotion guy because that was the only thing they gave me to make. Mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed to make shows. I didn't know how to make shows. I mean, honestly, I, I didn't know how to make shows until we started making them. Mm -hmm. um, but I loved cartoons as a kid. Mm -hmm. I had fallen out, you know, <laughs> like when the Beatles came, I was all Beatles all the time and, you know, cartoons were for babies. <laughs> um, but I never lost that feeling for them. And the idea that, you know, one of the things when we were trying to figure out MTV, one of the analogies I came up with is, you know, cartoons are rock and roll for kids, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? You know, it had that kind of zip and zang and, you know, excitement that I want to hold your hand had, you know? <laughs> and, and so, again, even though I had had nothing to do with cartoons, the idea of sort of recapturing that feeling and being part of it, you know, I didn't think it would last that long. I mean, I, that was 30 years ago. I can't believe, you know, I didn't get into cartoons until I was 40. Mm -hmm. But it's been awesome, mm -hmm. you know? And as I was saying to um, a couple of the filmmakers I was talking to before, we don't have to worry about, like, the losing the light we don't have to worry <laughs> about the actors at the end of the day going off and uh, drugging and partying and mm -hmm. getting arrested and showing up in the newspaper. Um, we don't have to worry about the weather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, my first mentor in, in cartoons said to me, it's really good at five o'clock, we get to turn off the lights and all our characters go to sleep in flat files. <laughs> <laughs> And I ended up really, really liking the people who wanted to make cartoons mm -hmm. and who wanted to make great cartoons. Yeah. You know, um, Hanna-Barbera at the time was really tired. Those people, they had been sort of left behind. All the good ones were hired away and went over to Warner Brothers to make Tiny Toons mm -hmm. and Batman and all. And all the people at Hanna-Barbera were really, they, they said, but we're Hanna-Barbera, and they were all demoralized about the fact that they were Hanna-Barbera. Mm -hmm. So I, I had a tough job in re-sparking them, but they all wanted to make cartoons, you know? It was like, I didn't have to do anything at that point. Mm -hmm. Fine, make cartoons, like, let's see what happens, mm -hmm. and they did it. Yeah. It feels like so much of your legacy within, within cartoons, but kids programming, however you wanna call it, also, treats kids with a lot of reverence and respect and treats them like they have a brain. And Jerry, Jerry Laybourne. Okay. We will not talk down to kids. Mm. We will talk to kids. Mm -hmm. We will never use a crayon and write a backwards letter like everybody in the toy and kids business seems to do. They, they think that kids are all dyslexic and they write backwards. Yeah. So we will never do that. Um, we will not think that there are cool kids and not cool kids. Mm -hmm. Being a kid is cool. What more do you want? Mm -hmm. So I, I learned that, I mean, you know, every one of us as children, um, most people here probably grew up with Rugrats. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing that those people did really beautifully is they really understood that as a kid, what we see are our parents' ankles and knees, <laughs> right? Like that's our perspective on life. Every kid, like, is eager for some kind of respect for somebody. And, you know, the parents are always kind of kicking you out of the way, mm -hmm. you know, in some way or other. And, and Jerry was determined that we were gonna treat children with respect. 
And again, not to go backwards, you know, to the MTV thing. That's how we all felt as teenagers too, right? And, you know, in, in my day, when my next door neighbor thought that Beethoven was like the thing, the, the, the father next door, and literally, I remember walking into his house. We were, you know, we were neighbors. We were suburban neighbors. We were friends. And I walked in with my 45 that had rollover Beethoven on it, <laughs> and I put it on his record player and played it. And I was like, basically sticking my tongue out at him. Mm-hmm. That's what every group of that's you know in the First Nations panel that that we just saw. Isn't that what we all want? Is somebody to like just treat us like halfway decent? We'll be, we'll love you forever. Mm-hmm. And so, I've been in communitized media. You know, I was in college radio where we played jazz and classical music. All we wanted was people to pay attention to us. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, so that's been true, literally, like along the way. Um, Casey started an anime channel for um, our YouTube business that we had. I don't know from, I still, to this day, I don't understand anime. (laughs) But all those people wanted, like, is like, you know, we have something we love. How come you don't like us? Mm -hmm. How come you don't like what we're doing? We're going to prove to you that what we're doing is easily as good as what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's what the, you know, the world's about. And so, again, for me personally, I'm not going to get involved unless I give a shit. Yeah. When it goes back to a little bit, this idea of community building, which I think you have talked a lot about feeling really connected to and do a great job at. And I think so many filmmakers are often trying to figure out, well, who is my community? Who are the people that I'm trying to reach out to? And I think treating them with respect is so important and seemingly doesn't always happen. Well, you know... um, uh, one of the guys I worked with for years and years in cartoons and had developed a bunch of our hit cartoons one day came to me and said, you know, every hit that we've had, the lead character is the creator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Never thought about it because, you know, 50% of the time they don't realize it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was a really interesting insight as to your community is you. And who, because every one of us, you know, like we all want to think we're special. We all are special, but let's be real. We're all part of some larger group, whether we recognize it or not. And I think we're all making, you know, yes, we make films for ourselves. And if we make a good film for ourselves, we're making it for a lot of other people too, just because we're not so special. We're I guess we're unique, but we're not so special. Mm -hmm. I guess that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. You know, I'm remiss. I don't have my phone on me. I just want to do a quick time check. I definitely want to make sure that everyone, you know, we can open this up for some Q&A. Do you want to just tell me? Oh, great. Um, So why don't we go? Do we have some questions? I mean, I could keep talking about so many wonderful things with you, but are there any questions out here from from the group? Anyone want to ask something? Yes. Microphone. Hello. Uh, Fred. So, Frederator, and it didn't really hit me until uh, many years after you formed Frederator and the the next uh, networks, you saw an opportunity for self-publishing and talking this morning uh, with some of the people in this room about being the CEO of your own content. And YouTube now is a mature platform. But Sadly. How did yeah. How, <laughs> how did you spot that opportunity? And again, it was an animation community internationally that kind yeah. of built Frederator. But was there something about taking the power away from the corporations or bigger Oh, platforms? yeah. I, um, the internet was another job that I turned down when somebody first called me. I'm like, you know, I'm too old for this. I'm just learning animation. I don't want to... It's enough that I order books on Amazon. What do I need to know about the internet, right? And, but I, I took this job, and I was completely unsuited for it. And I left the job because I was unsuited for it and started my own little thing. And over the course of the few years after I left the internet, the, when I got in, it was still very 
obsessively technology oriented. It was, infra you know, most of what Silicon Valley has built for us is infrastructure. They put the, the, the plumbing under the roads, you know. But we all like drive on the roads. And I was waiting for this moment where the technology was such that even a 55 year old guy to take ad advantage of it. And as I started to realize what was possible, I was like, oh my God, maybe I have a chance to do something on my own. So I had a young, I luckily I had a bunch of young folk around me. I was like the blind old man in the forest and I had these young tech people who would hold my hand and walk me through so that I had a chance to survive, right? And I went to one of them when we were just launching this show, My Life as a Teenage Robot. And I said, you know, all this internet stuff you want me to do is expensive, it's complicated, it requires things I don't understand, but I want to do some, I got to do something for my show in the internet. What should I do? He said, oh, you know, and this is, 2003, and he said, you know, we were talking with our friend John about blogs, why don't you start a blog? And at the time, most blogs were sort of anonymous diary pages of teenage girls, you know, and I'd like it didn't, I said, well, what do I do on this blog? And he goes, oh, you know what to do. And I go, yeah, great, what, what, what do I do? He goes, you know, post often, post short, always post a picture. I went, right, I, I can do that. So then, of course, I called someone who worked for me because I was used to being an executive and go, now you have to start a blog for Teenage Robot and you have to post often, post short, and always post a picture. So what did he do? He went and found somebody else to, to do it and we did it. And about a month later, I looked at our stats and we're like, oh my God, we didn't do anything other than put these things up and we have 2,000 readers already. And I looked at my small team and I said, you know, we don't need to work for the man anymore. We can do it ourselves. And that was sort of the beginning of doing it. Uh, you know, one thing led to another, led to another, led to YouTube. But the idea that we could do for ourselves what we used to have to go and beg a billionaire to please give us some of your thousands of dollars so we can do our thing, like, fuck you. You know, we can build an audience on our own. And sure enough, um, you know, we launched a show on, Net on Netflix yesterday called Be and Puppy Cat. We launched it on our own. We, you know, we, we found a couple of shekels somewhere and we made a little short film the audience went crazy for the short film and we have no more money. So we go to Kickstarter. We raised enough money to make a series. It was like unbelievable. Now, could we do it again? Probably not. You know, things change, you know, over time. It's a different world and all that. But the idea, here, here's what I would say to the young filmmakers, and I really meant it. When we would make something for Nickelodeon or for Cartoon Network or for the Family Channel or for Netflix, if it didn't work, it was always their fault. You know, we're geniuses, we make great stuff. We gave them a great show or we gave them a great movie. They put it in the wrong time slot, Netflix doesn't promote anything, they told us to make the shoes green instead of blue, it's all, the show didn't work because of them. And I said, the great thing now is you can look in the mirror and know exactly who to blame. Because if it worked, it was you. And if it didn't work, it was you. And you had to solve your own problems. And to me, there's nothing. So when I worked at Hanna-Barbera, I have, my whole family's in Europe. That's where all my relatives live. And my cousin's best friend, I'm not gonna go so far, uh, was part of a big ratings agency. They were very wealthy. And the daughter wanted to be, make films. Do you have a job for her? Well, I had a temp job. She could be my temp secretary for two months while my secretary was off doing something. So 
So one day I walk out of my office and she's reading a fucking book. This is what she's doing. I'm like, why are you reading a book? Well, there's nothing else that I... I said, I, I thought you wanted to be a filmmaker. She said, oh yeah, I want to be a documentary filmmaker. I said, well, what are you reading a book for? Or like, why are you making a documentary film? Well, you know, I need to find the money to make the film. I need the lights and the cameras and the this and that. And this is way before iPhones. And I'm like, can't you just like go and buy one of those VHS cameras and like make a documentary? And she looked at me like I had three heads. I was like, okay, well this girl is useless. And by the way, I've never heard of her since. She's not making documentary films. She's not in the television, but I have no idea what happened to her. YouTube, Instagram, whatever, TikTok, Every one of them is there for every single person who wants to make films to make films. And like, to me, that was magic. And it's still magic. I can't do it. I'm too old, I'm too slow, I'm too fat, I'm too set in my ways. But God, I think it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, yes, it's ruined the world and you know we have disinformation and I believe all that stuff and it's terrible and we have Donald Trump doing all the stuff that they do and all, it's magic. Any of us who are not Donald Trump and wanna do wonderful things, it's there waiting for us to do. And it's, it's waiting for us to do our version of what could be great to change the world. I, 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 I'm sorry, you got me off on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's amazing, and that's why I got in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to work for the man anymore. And it kind of worked for a while. <laughs> it's a little hard, it's harder today. But, you know, there's TikTok. Mm -hmm. And it's getting hard too, and then there'll be something past TikTok. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 the, that's really what's going on in this world, right? Is this, this, by the time any of us notice TikTok, there'll be somebody else doing something that we think is even crazier than TikTok and will work. Do we have another question? We have a, probably time for one. How about right here? I'm sorry, I have long answers. No, it's okay. Uh, the future of animation is probably AI. In other words, animation is gonna get simpler and simpler to create. Um, it already is. Yeah, so what do you project into the future? I don't ever. Um, if I knew the future, I'd already be rich and famous and all that type of stuff. I can only deal with what is today and take advantage of what is today. In There's somebody out there that'll figure it out. But, you know, I, um, in the internet days, in the, in, the, in the last internet days, I guess, I would always say that, you know, there was a lot of talk about who's the first mover and you know some of those m first movers are multi multi billionaires god bless them i'm not a first mover i'm the first of the second movers mm -hmm. i get in kind of early but i'm not the earliest um, i don't have that kind of frontier spirit but the second i can take advantage of it i'm really really happy to take advantage of it so i'm not really sure i just personally discovered ai for still images, mm -hmm. I've been going crazy, <laughs> like taking the pictures of my grandmother from 1956 and going, oh, that's what granny looks like, you know, mm -hmm. that type of stuff. So I'm a little slow on that front. Um, here's what I, at heart, I understand though, because at every level of technology, Somebody has said to me, and you know, we don't need people to do X anymore. I'm like, bullshit. You know, the, the truth is no matter what machines we have that can do whatever it is they do for us, it's for us. And there's somebody there, back to my jazz guy who said you have to pick the person in the room. There's somebody in the room that is causing something to happen, whatever technology they're taking advantage of in the moment. And I can't wait for whatever is new for somebody else to do it because I'm not gonna, now I really am too old to do it. 
Wonderful. One more. Anyone have one final question? Great. Can you say it a little louder? I'm sorry. Oh, got it. Um, I'll tell it, it's actually really relevant to today. Um, one of the things I noticed when I had kids, and I, I had already been in the kids' business for several years at that point, is, uh, you know, kids don't know how to read. At least my kids didn't at six or seven. Um, and one day, um, I'm walking with one of my kids, I think he was probably four or five, and we're walking by um, a phone booth that had an ad on the side, and he starts screaming, November 4th! <laughs> and we keep walking, and he goes, November 4th! I go, what are you talking about? Monsters, Inc., November 4th. He had seen a picture of Monsters, Inc., and the debut date, I guess, was ne November 4th or something like that. Well, where had he found out? He didn't find it out from the poster. He didn't read November 4th. He saw an ad for Monsters, Inc., you know, on television. Kids get their information out of television. At Nickelodeon in those days, here's the information they gave. They started spouting off what was happening on every episode of every one of their shows, none of which the kids had ever heard of. The kids didn't know the show. So they didn't really care that Casey was gonna get a haircut next week on the, on the episode, or that Deirdre was gonna like, you know, have fun with her friends next week on the episode. They didn't care about these things. Nickelodeon was telling them nothing. So when they did research, and they asked the kids, why don't you watch Nickelodeon, whether the kid was 10 or 7 or 5 or 4. They, well, you know, Nickelodeon's for babies. Mm. Because their point of view was anyone who was younger than them was a baby, <laughs> and Nickelodeon was for somebody that was younger than them. No, nobody felt it was for them. So what my partner and I did, and they, um, the way they did it, Nickelodeon at the time, they licensed all their program, they didn't make any programs, they didn't have any money. And so they would run the program, and whatever time was left at the end of the program, they'd run a promo, and if they had no time, they'd just start the next show. So they weren't telling anybody anything. So what my partner and I did was we reorganized the entire clock so that there was two minutes an hour to tell kids things. And the things we told them had nothing to do with the shows. We just said Nickelodeon is the greatest place in the world for kids. It's only for kids. It's the only place on television anywhere that's just for kids. There's no parents, there's no you know, bombs, there's no this, there's no that. It's just kids programming seven days a week, every day. And all of a sudden the kids went, wow, there's something for me, and they started watching. Mm -hmm. The reason I said it's relevant to today is you know, the kid side of the business is in a shit show right now. It is total chaos. And the reason it's in chaos is because Netflix decided that the way to engage kids is to give them a lot of stuff and tell them nothing about it. They give you a thumbnail and expect that you're supposed to figure out what show to watch from one little, they've, they've tested a hundred thumbnails to find the right thumbnail, like that gives a kid information. And everyone else in the, I hope you don't ask me this tomorrow and I get into a fight with Jules about it, but every other channel has stopped telling kids stuff. They just put the shows on and no one watches them so they make reboots because at least somebody's heard of it. Nobody tells anybody anything about it, and we're in this emotional business where we try to get, we, we have each made our films and our series with everything that we have. Even if we're doing it on assignment, we're like in love with the show that we're in because you can't like make it without like caring about it on some level or other. And then they just slap it up there and go, ah, nobody's watching, and they take it off. 
The world is in chaos because nobody is helping us fall in love with these films that we make and these series that we make. Nobody. The first stream, well, Crunchyroll used to. They don't do it so much anymore. The first one of these streamers that bothers to have a dialogue with their audience and proving to their audience that they should be in love with the programs, they win. But at the moment, everyone's losing because of it. It's why we're in chaos. Anyway, you didn't ask that question. The way we did it is we told people that Nickelodeon was a wonderful place for kids, and they believed us, and it turned out to be true. Did that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, well, Fred, thank you so, so much for the time. It was so great.